We welcome you all to the alumni sponsored distinguished lecture organized by University of Hyderabad and SP Acure Lab. It is an honor to have Professor Douglas C. Wallace amongst us today. Professor Wallace is a professor at the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, and director of the Center for Mitochondrial and Epigenomic Medicine, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Today, Professor Wallace will be presenting a talk entitled, A Mitochondrial Etiology of Common Complex Diseases. May I now invite our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Aparav Odile, the Dean School of Life Sciences, Professor Dayananda, our guest of honor, Professor Wallace, onto the stage. We would like to welcome the dignitaries with bouquet presentation on behalf of the organizers. Now, I would like to request our Vice Chancellor, Professor Aparao Bodile, to kindly preside and introduce our guest of honor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I would first like to request uh, Professor Dayananda, the School of Life Sciences, to extend a welcome to the gathering. Good afternoon, dignitaries and the dais, Professor Parav Padali, Young Dynamic Vice Chancellor of this prestigious institute, D.C. Wallace, from Penn State, UPenn, United States, my good colleagues, Professor Redana, Professor Raghavendra, Professor A.R. Reddy, Professor Rohit Sethi, Dr. Mohanachari, who refused to be a professor in this university and became industrialist elsewhere, and many young colleagues, faculty members, students. I take it this opportunity to welcome you all for this distinguished lecture by E.C. Wallace. I also take this opportunity to introduce this school because it is my duty rather to tell about the school to this August gathering. School of Life Sciences started about 25 years ago has grown tremendously in all walks of life. We have five departments offering number of PG courses in basic sciences, applied sciences, with 60 faculty members specialized in various areas of life sciences. We have recently created an interdisciplinary department, Department of Systems and Computational Biology. We realized the importance of interdisciplinarity in understanding the fundamental issues of biology and we therefore brought people from all disciplines to the 
life sciences and we have placed them under this roof under one single umbrella and all of them tirelessly work to understand various complex problems of biology we have master students m tech phd's and we also have faculty recruited by national institutes like dst inspire ugc research faculty and ugc uh, dbt ramalinga swami ramalinga fellowships all these people tirelessly work to make the school a vibrant uh, institution uh, working tirelessly uh, on various aspects of biology we get huge amount of grants from different funding agencies recently i must share this news proudly stars program introduced by ministry of human resource development is meant for only iits and iiss and only the high end institutions having uh, irc rank of uh, 20 or less and this program flagship program of mhrd recently announced for uh, competitive grants from the school of life sciences at least five people have got this grant under this stars program that speaks about the competence and eminent scholarship that we have in school of life sciences we have 196 lakh worth grants earned from dbt dst csir or all other funding agencies and we also have nearly 50 crores worth grant sponsored by industries such vibrant school you cannot imagine in a university system there may be uh, departments like this uh, uh, in the csir laboratories but in university system having a school with 60 independent labs with the latest ultra modern cutting edge facilities it is very hard to find in the university system this is one such type of uh, institutions we are all uh, proud to work here and we continue to uh, strive hard to bring eminence to the university as well as students students graduated here are all over the world they are not only working in the industry or in the academic institutions in the country they have been working all over the world in different laboratories you go to any city in united states and even japan germany uh, and uh, uh, united kingdom you find students of university of hyderabad recently i was in uh, university halle and i was taking uh, food in uh, university manza and about four people came during uh, lunch time when i was like taking lunch they all said in the ran towards my uh, desk and told the doctor sir we graduated from university of hyderabad who were students of life sciences or students of chemistry physics looking at this my german collaborator who was hosting me he said hey, even if you go to heaven there will be somebody from the university of hyderabad all over you have friends not only <laughs> in india even in germany so that is the uh, competence that we have displayed the students and faculty are sought after all over the world and all that credit goes to my faculty who work night and day to bring excellence to this department with this few words i extend warm welcome to you all and on behalf of you i welcome uh, dc valais for this uh, uh, institution and school of life sciences thank you very much thank you professor dananda i take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to everyone here where i see very special guests from the neighboring institutions scientists the faculty and the directors of the institute and our former colleague who also happened to be here for a short visit professor mohan si vemuri and our senior colleagues who superannuated from here 
very nice to see him, a mitochondria man, uh, Professor Rohit Shetty, faculty colleagues, students, and invited guests. It's a privilege for me to extend a warm welcome to all of you for this uh, distinguished lecture at University of Hyderabad. This distinguished lecture has something special in it. That's where I thought I'll make a mention of that. University of Hyderabad has organized this series with great privilege. We always felt that it, is, it will be an honor for us to uh, respect some distinguished academicians who come from different parts of the world and rec request them to deliver a lecture, which we call it as Distinguished Lecture Series. And very recently, we have also started Alumni Speaker Series. And yesterday, you heard the second of that Alumni Speaker Series lecture, which was given by Dr. Balkrishna Reddy. And this lecture, I am making a special mention about the Distinguished Lecture. A lecture which is not only organized by University of Hyderabad, but it is entirely sponsored by our alumnus, Dr. Vijay, who is sitting in the audience. I would like to make a special mention, Dr. Vijay, for making it possible for bringing, a, bringing our distinguished guest to the campus and or allowing University of Hyderabad to have this lecture here. I think there, if I start giving an introduction about Doug Wallace, about whom you have seen in the poster, you must have read already on the net and you must have seen some of the things that are already posted there. It will take a long time. But all that very briefly I have to do, I would like to introduce him to you. I had a very brief interaction with him this forenoon. And I realized the amount of research contributions that he has made and the pioneering works that he has done in the area of in maternal inheritance linked to the mitochondria, then linking it to, uh, and studying its role in diseases. That's the most pioneering contribution where he is known throughout the world for what he has done in these many years of his research career. And I was recalling uh, 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 the, as a, uh, a person working, uh, having exposure to plant pathology, I was recalling an experience of uh, how a mitochondria and, or a mitochondrial protein could be associated with uh, uh, the development of a disease in plant system. That was in Texas male sterile cytoplasm, inherited uh, uh, hybrid lines that succumb to a disease which was not there before because a pathogen, a particular race of a pathogen has evolved to attack or to interact with a specific protein, mitochondrial protein, which is located on the Christi of the mitochondria. The, they call it as uh, TARF-13 uh, protein. And a person who has seen that kind of, uh, who has understood that kind of a disease, in involvement of mitochondria and disease, I thought, here is a man who has studied several wonderful things, not simply one such thing about the involvement of mitochondria and disease. And he named an important contribution that is related to mitochondria, mitochondrial etiology of the disease that Doug, uh, our Doug Wallace is associated with that. And that's where he is recognized and we are honored. We are really pleased to have you here today, uh, Professor Doug Wallace at University of Hyderabad to deliver this lecture, a distinguished lecture series sponsored by our alum. I just would like to mention, uh, if I don't mention anything, it will be a mistake on my part. So I would like to mention a couple of things. There are several awards and honors that he has won. He has received Gruber Genetics Prize, the world's highest genetics honor, as well as American College of Physi Physicians Award for outstanding work in science as related to medicine. I'm just mentioning only a couple of them because I want him to talk to you more rather than I talk about his uh, CV, reading everything line by line here. 
He is a recipient of the uh, from the Franklin Institute's prestigious Benjamin Franklin Medal for the Life Sciences. The citation reads like this: For demonstrating the material inheritance of mitochondrial DNA in humans, using mitochondrial DNA variation to reconstruct ancient human migrations, identifying the first mitochondrial DNA mutation associated with a with an inherited disease sorry with an inherited disease and showing that mutant mitochondrial dna can profoundly affect the nuclear genome causing complex diseases that's the topic which he has given to us thereby leading the way to therapies for those diseases and the aging processes this is the citation for the benjamin franklin uh, medal that he has received from the franklin institution and couple of recent awards that he has received. In 2017, uh, Doug Wallace received the Paul Jan Jennison Award for Biomedical Research, which is awarded to uh, Wallace for pioneering contribution in the field of mitochondrial genetics and application to the study of disease, aging, and patterns of human migration. This fall, the most recent one that he was honored with was in 2019, Charles Hoppel Prize for Outstanding Contributions in Mitochondrial Research. This is very brief about uh, Professor Doug Wallace. He, this is the speaker that I am presenting to you for today's Distinguished Lecture Series. And I am sure several of you would recall that this hall had hosted lectures of Nobel laureates. Soon, all of us in this auditorium wish that Professor Doug Wallace be honored in a, in a year or two with a Nobel Prize, which will be a fitting honor for all his contributions that he has made so far. With these few words, Professor Wallace, I request you to present your talk. Okay, well, I am honored to be here. I really want to uh, thank very much S.P. Akura for this um, wonderful opportunity to visit with you all and for the gracious hospitality that the Vice Chancellor and the Dean and all of you have provided to my colleague, Prasant, and myself. It is truly uh, a great honor to be here and a pleasure to be with all of you. So we're going to talk about the other human cell. And you might ask, why would uh, we want to be interested in the other human cell? Um, and I'm going to argue that um, if we don't understand this other human cell, then we cannot really understand all the complex diseases that are the major threats to global population right now. And what are those diseases? Well, they're the neuropsychiatric diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, autism, et cetera, um, bipolar, schizophrenia. There are also, though, the um, cardiovascular diseases that affect the heart, cardiovascular disease, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, or the visceral uh, diseases. Um, such as uh, would affect, oops, sorry. We're not going to the meeting yet. Um, visceral diseases, uh, such as those that affect the rene, uh, the kidney, the heart, or the immunological system, or the metabolic diseases, diabetes, obesity, uh, generally metabolic syndrome, or cancer and aging. What is really uh, discouraging in the biomedical arena is uh, the global uh, community is spending literally the equivalent of trillions of dollars to understand these diseases, yet with all the effort that we've all put into it and all the money that we've invested, we've really not effectively eliminated any one of these diseases or even really materially uh, able to treat them in an effective way. So that's really a, a surprise because you would think with all the resources that have been invested, we should have been able to do better. So then the question is, well, why didn't we do better? Again, it isn't that we haven't put enough time. It isn't that we haven't put enough money. Um, there must be something else wrong. And there was a philosopher of science uh, named Thomas Kuhn, and he argued that when uh, science invests more and more resources in trying to solve a problem, and they get progressively less uh, success in achieving that um, uh, answer, then what is often the problem is not the effort, but the basic assumptions on which they're addressing that problem. He called these assumptions paradigms. 
And so then the question is, if a paradigm problem is the problem we're confronted, then the first question is, what are the paradigms that we're using to investigate these diseases, and what might be wrong with them? So uh, we argue in our group that there are two fundamental paradigms that we have used to address these problems. So they go back to um, basic in instruction and in in uh, visions that were occurring in Western Europe almost a half a millennia ago. Uh, one was a fellow named Vesalius, and he was the first person to really begin to uh, systematize the anatomy of the human body. Um, and uh, he uh, basically uh, made such a transformative effect by analyzing the human body that all subsequent physicians came to specialize in different parts of the body. And that's gone on now for the last 500 years. So today we have ophthalmologists, neurologists, nephrologists, cardiologists, dermatologists, and all of those people then study an organ-specific disease. So that has led to the idea that if you have a symptom in an organ, then the disease is caused by that organ, a defect in that organ. That's what we call the anatomical paradigm of disease. So if I get a headache then, uh, and my uh, primary care physician can't help me, then he would send me to the neurologist who would look at my head and think, oh, well, there's something wrong with your neuron. Um, but the other major paradigm is one that's much more recent. That goes back to a guy named Mend Mendel, and he began to study pea plants, but a very so small subset of the inheritance pattern gene of the pea plants followed an inheritance that he proposed had two copies of that phenomenon, that genetic component in each individual. One went to each gamete, and they came back together uh, in the next individual. And we call that the Mendelian inheritance of, uh, this, of uh, genetics. Now, the Mendelian inheritance of genetics then uh, led to another corollary, and that is if something is inherited according to laws of Mendel, it's genetic, but if it isn't, then it must be environmental. So those two ideas underlie most of the research that's done in biomedical research to answer these questions. But it is true that all the anatomical genes are located in the chromosomes, and the chromosomes are in the nucleus, and those chromosomal genes are inherited according to the laws of Mendel. So as long as you're studying anatomical traits, they will Mendelize. But in fact, most of these diseases, when you look at their inheritance pattern, they don't follow a classic Mendelian inheritance. But they're clearly transmitted through families. So there's something wrong with that paradigm. And so what we argued is that um, to be alive, you not only need anatomy, what you see in the mirror, but you also need what animates you, that is energy. Um, and another uh, scientist half a millennia ago named Newton argued that mass doesn't move unless it's acted on by energy. And since you're the most animated thing in the environment, then clearly energy must be central to everything that you do. So we argued that maybe by just studying anatomy, we were missing half of the major conceptual framework that we needed to understand human health and disease, and that we should then also study energy. So to be alive, you need anatomy, energy, you need information for anatomy, which is in the chromosomes and nuclear, but you also need information for energy. And I'm going to argue that the most important energy genes are not in the chromosomes, and they do not, are not inherited according to the laws of Mendel, and that has been a major oversight in our trying to understand the inheritance of these diseases. So I'm going to argue that it's defects in bioenergetics and non-Mendelian inherit, uh, inherited genes that are the missing understanding and link to understanding the common diseases. And once we address these ideas, I do believe we have the opportunity to understand and ultimately cure these diseases. Children's Hospital of Philadelphia is going to completely ruin this lecture. That is problematic. I hope it doesn't shut me down. Uh-huh. Okay. This is a problem. <laughs> oh, gosh. Mm. Do you have another computer? Uh, there is going to be a slight uh, pause because my institution decided it didn't want me to give this lecture. Just we'll run it from this.
Yeah, you um, said this. I'll keep giving the lecture until it shuts down, and then I'll switch. Sorry for that interlude. Every time I boot up the computer the first time, it wants to upgrade my software. Okay, so anyway, um, moving right along, how did this dichotomy come about? Well, it actually came about by a symbiosis that occurred two and a half billion years ago when two, um, two different life forms came together. One was an archaeobacteria, the other was an oxidative bacteria, and they form a symbiosis. And that symbiosis then um, ultimately gave rise to what we call the eukaryotic cell. Now, this event occurred one and only one time. So if that event did not occur, then there would be no higher plants and animals uh, on this planet. So that was a really important and unique event. So one... Okay. That is not helping. So anyway, the point is that there are two different life forms. And one of the life forms was basically a glycolytic bacteria, archaeobacteria, the other was an oxidative bacteria. And that oxidative bacteria ultimately became specialized to form bacteria that live inside your cells called mitochondria. So sitting in your chair right now are 100 trillion separate cells. Each of those cells has about 1,000 of these bacteria called mitochondria. And they then form this relationship that allows you to uh, exist and function. And the mitochondria then generate 90% of all the energy uh, that you use in your body. Now originally these two life forms had co-equal nuclei, but bacteria exchange genetic information. And one of the interesting and complicated things about bacteria is that they can only make enough energy to maintain their own DNA, make it into RNA, translate it into protein, and some of their adaptive functions. So they're limited by their energy. So the problem was when all the bacteria got inside the cell, they were still using up all their energy for their own um, biogenesis. However, by exchanging some of the genes from the original bacteria into the nuclear genome, then what happened is, then what happened is that you could take the hundreds to thousands of copies of the bacterial genome and move uh, one copy into the nuclear genome. So now you had two copies of the nuclear genome that could do the same function as previously a copy was present in all the bacteria. So what you had then is you had a thousand savings, a thousand fold savings of energy. And that allowed then the creation of a situation where you can now have extra energy to have a complex nucleus. And with that complex nucleus, lots more genes and therefore a lot more structure. And that then allowed to have complicated plants and animals. So it was basically a bioenergetic solution that, al that allowed the formation of complex eukaryotic cells. Now both of these systems have their own DNA replication, transcribed into RNA, and the RNA translated um, on ribosomes into proteins. Mitochondrial DNA is replicated inside the mitochondria, uh, transcribed into transfer RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and it has its own set of ribosomes, and they're bacteria-like. They're initiated by N-formal methionine. They're sensitive to chloramphenicol and aminoglycoside antibiotics. And these, uh, and these ribosomes then make the key wiring diagram for making the power of our cells, the mitochondrial power plant. So they make 13 polypeptides, seven of the 45 polypeptides of complex one, one of the 11 polypeptides of complex three, three of the 13 polypeptides of complex four, and two of the 17 polypeptides of complex five. And as you'll see, those key polypeptides then are basically the electron and proton carriers that allow the power plant to function. So it's just like building a power plant here uh, in Hyderabad. You would have power plants around the city. Each power plant is organized um, with the, the structure of the building and the parking lot and so on by the city manager. But each of the power plants has its own unique wiring diagram because each wiring diagram is unique to the power plant. And that's exactly how you're designed in relation to your cells. So the mitochondria then generate energy uh, through this system. They have an outer membrane, an intermembrane space, an inner membrane, and a matrix. They take reducing equivalents, in this case glucose. Glucose is managed through glycolysis to give you pyruvate. Pyruvate can be reduced to give you lactate, or it can give an amino group to give you alanine. 
But pyruvate then enters the mitochondria through a transporter and then the pyruvate dehydrogenase to drive the tricarboxylic acid cycle, creating acetyl-CoA as the first step. And that then, the tricarboxylic acid cycle's purpose is to strip the hydrogens off the hydrocarbons and put it on the carrier NAD. So now you have the reduced form NADH, and you're not going to burn the hydrogen of the NADH uh, through the electron transport chain, complex 1, coenzyme Q, complex 3, cytochrome C, complex 4. And as the electrons flow down this electro, uh, electron transport chain, they're used to pump protons from the mitochondrial matrix across the inner membrane into the intermembrane space to give you acid and positive on the outside and alkaline negative on the inside. And that potential energy, then, is what you use for everything you do in your life. So sitting in your chair, 10 to the 17th uh, mitochondria, each of those mitochondria has a membrane potential of 0.2 volts. So the total energy sitting in your chair right now is the equivalent of a lightning bolt. And that's the reason why you can do all the things that you do. That's your potential energy. And if you don't think this is really an important project or topic, just stop breathing for 15 minutes. Let's see what happens. Okay. So you can then convert this potential energy into chemical energy through the ATP synthase or complex 5. Protons flow through complex 5, condense ADP and phosphate to make ATP. Then the ADP and ATP are exchanged across the inner membrane by the adenine translocators. There they go out through the voltage-dependent anion channel, and their ATP is hydrolyzed to ADP to go back in and to be rephosphorylated. And here's work is done. So basically then, if everybody in this room has a slightly different efficiency of burning the hydrogen in your food to pump protons out and then converting those protons into ATP. And we call that the coupling efficiency. So if you're very efficient at burning hydrogen to make a proton gradient and converting that into ATP to do work, then you'll need to burn the minimum amount of calories for the maximum amount of work. And a calorie is a unit of heat. So therefore, you'll make, generate the minimum amount of heat uh, in the maximum amount of work. But if you're less efficient at pumping protons out or converting them to ATP, then you're going to need to burn more calories for the same amount of ATP. But now you're going to have to ge be generating more heat. So that's a loosely coupled or slightly uncoupled uh, system. And as you'll see, that kind of coupling efficiency is just one of the many ways that genetic variation in the mitochondria has allowed our ancestors to adapt to different parts of the world. Now, the mitochondria also, as being a furnace, it makes um, uh, incomplete combustion products, and those are called reactive oxygen species. So electrons from complex 1, CoQ, and complex 3 can go to O2 to give you an unpaired electron superoxide anion. Manganese SOD will take that to hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide can be further reduced to hydroxyl radical, and these are the reactive oxygen species that you might uh, want to get rid of if you take vitamin C, CoQ, um, and vitamin E in your diet. We can detoxify hydrogen peroxide by reducing equivalents generated by the nicotinamide nucleoside transhydrogenase and glutathione peroxidase to make water, but that's a rate limiting step. The mitochondrial membrane potential can be used to take up calcium, and calcium is a major inorganic regulator of metabolism, and we have a self destruct system and permeability transition for. And nobody really knows its structure, but basically it's a uh, closed door, but it's sensitive to oxidative stress, uh, changes in the membrane potential, and calcium. And when those get out of balance, it opens the door, short circuits the membrane potential, fluids flow in, the inner membrane swells, the outer membrane is opened by backs and back proapoptotic proteins. These stored proteins are released, and they degrade the cell from inside out. Why would you want to have this in intrinsic process of apoptosis? because these are bacteria. If you release the bacteria in the bloodstream, you will get more inflammation. So you have to get rid of the bacteria by digesting them before they're released. Now, the mitochondria then regulate energy metabolism, reactive oxygen species, uh, redox balance, calcium, apoptosis. They generate signal transduction, all of the ATP, but they also generate all the intermediates to regulate the epigenome through the TCA cycle, as you'll see. Now, the an interesting aspect about your body is that just like your city here, different parts of your body rely on mitochondrial energy to different extents. So your brain is 2% of your body weight, but uses 20% of your energy. So a 5% reduction in your uh, mitochondrial energetics systemically will give you a brain-specific phenotype. You can go to the neurologist and he can study your brain anatomy all he wants, but you're not going to understand why that 5% energy deficiency is giving you a very bad headache. So the, uh, the hierarchy of energetics is brain, heart, muscle, renal, and endocrine systems. 
and those are all the ones that are affected in the common disease. Now, the mitochondrial genome is now distributed across the nuclear genome and the mitochondrial DNA. So about one to 2,000 genes are now uh, for the mitochondria now in the nuclear genome, but the mitochondrial DNA um, codes for these 13 critical polypeptides. So these are uh, uh, ribosomal RNAs for 12S and uh, 16S for the mitochondrial ribosome, a, tw a set of 22 transfer RNAs that punctuate the genes, and then seven, ND1, 2, 3, 4, L4, 5, and 6 for complex 1, cytochrome B for complex 3, CO1, 2, and 3 for complex 4, cytochrome oxidase, and ATPA 6 and 8 for complex 5. So why keep these 13 polypeptides when you put 2,000 in the nucleus? And the reason is because everybody here has a slightly different energetics. And that much of that energetics, as you'll see, is due to changes in the mitochondrial DNA. So if, in fact, there were two individuals that decided to marry their mitochondrial DNAs and they underwent recombination, then you might have a loosely coupled mitochondrial DNA from one individual and a tightly coupled mitochondrial DNA from the other individual, and now you've mixed the wiring diagrams of the power plants. So it's like putting capacitors and um, uh, resistors into from two different power plants and just mixing them up. Well, what would happen? It would short out. So Mother Nature was very worried about that. Why would it, how would we avoid having the energetic system short out by recombination? And then she thought a lot about it, and being Mother Nature, she realized that the problem is men. Everybody knows that. So anyway, how did she deal with that? She eliminated men. So basically then, what we have is the mitochondrial DNA is inherited from mother to all of her children, but her daughters transmitted to their children, but the male's mitochondria enter the egg, are seen as for it, and are selectively thrown out and destroyed. So men, don't feel bad, it's happened for two billion years. Anyway, so the idea of having uniparental inheritance then avoids recombination, and therefore the only way the mitochondrial DNA can change is by sequential mutation on radiating maternal lineages. And so, as you'll see, we can sequence the mitochondrial DNA of any two of you, and the number of nucleotide differences is directly proportional to the time you shared a common mother, because that's the only way it can change. Okay, so um, the mitochondrial DNA is present in hundreds to thousands of copies in the cell, and it's constantly replicating inside the cell, and therefore accumulating mutations. And that will create inside the cell a mixture of bacteria, some of which are mutant, shown in red, and some of which are normal. If the cell divided down the middle, then this cell would get an uh, equal number of mutant and normal as this cell. But if it divided this way, then this cell would have only normal, and this would have twice as many mutants. So it turns out that the mitochondrial genotype segregates during mitosis because of this random distribution of the mitochondrial DNA into the daughter cells. And so now you can have different proportions of mutant mitochondria in the same individual derived from an egg that was had this mixed cytoplasm called heteroplasma. And the more mutant mitochondrial DNAs you have, the less energy you have until it crosses the minimum for that organ to function energetically, and you have the equivalent of a metropolitan brownout, that organ now malfunctions. That's the bioenergetic threshold. Now, there are, 13, uh, there are three classic basic types of variants that are important in human, of mitochondrial DNA and hu understanding human health. First are mutations that occur along the radiating maternal lineage. So that's just a, an example would be a mutation in the tRNA leucine gene at 3243. Uh, that's the nucleotide position. So if you inherit that mutation at 20 to 30 percent mutant, you'll get type 1, type 2 diabetes. At 50 percent, you'll get neurodegenerative disease and muscle disease. And at 100 percent heteroplasmy, you'll die as an uh, infant with Lee syndrome. Or a mutation in the TRN ND4 gene at 11778. If you inherit that from your mother, you'll be fine until you go to college, and suddenly you lose vision in one eye, and within a year in the other eye, labors hereditary optic neuropathy. Or a mutation in the ATPA6 gene at 8993, at 70% mutant, will give you retinal degeneration. 85% kills your uh, brain stem and your cerebellum, and at 100% mutant, kills you as an infant with Lee syndrome. So we have a quantitative energetic disease, quantitative genetics. There are hundreds of these maternally inherited diseases. There are also ancient variants, like this variant in ND1 defines lineages that are three quarters of all the people from Sub-Saharan Africa. So we call that macro haplogroup L. Variant H, this variant in CO1, defines variants for half of Europeans. Variant A, B, 
B, C, and D. Those variants arose in Central Asia. They crossed the Bering Wind Bridge, colonized the Americas. These are variants that define lineages that I'm going to argue allowed our ancestors to adapt to different environments. And finally, we're accumulating somatic mutations as we age um, through our lifespan. And those then erode our energetics, and that creates the aging clock. Okay. So then, what's interesting about this idea is where is this energy concentrated? So if you look at the uh, basic structure of a mitochondria, it has this outer membrane and inner membrane, and then these enfoldings called Christi. And we know that this matrix part is the, where the hydroxyl ions are, and then the positive question, is, where is the protons? Well, the original model was that they were out in this intermem intermembrane space, but that really doesn't make sense because there's a lot more volume here than here. Well, it turns out, if you look at these uh, mitochondria, um, when they get in contact with each other, here's one mitochondria, here's another, they have this very interesting structure in that all of the Christi are aligned with each other. And so what that means is that the Christi are somehow interacting with each other. And what we've been able to show is that the electron transport chain is aligned along these Christi, pumps the protons into these inter stitual areas, and there's a plug here, which is organized by OPA1 and the so-called Mikos complex, that closes that lumen. And now, inside each of these very, very small volume is where all the protons are. So now we have a huge electrostatic field. And we think that electrostatic field is repelling the mitochondrial Christi, creating this alignment. Because if we then make a... Um, <coughs> uh, a uh, graphene film, and graphene is a carbon, a hexagonal carbon array with pi orbitals. That's the flow of electrons is very sensitive to pH. So we can then adhere um, a mitochondria with an antibody to the graphene film. And if we add what's called an uncoupler, which just punches the holes in all the membranes, then all of the um, alkaline, uh, uh, all of the hydroxyl radicals and the protons all neutralize. And what happens is your membrane potential goes down, and the outside, because all the uh, protons are flowing in to neutralize the um, matrix, your pH goes up. But if you put in an enzyme that cleaves OPA1, then rather than the pH going up, the pH drops. And that's because you've opened all these Christi and released all of the protons out into the matrix. So now we have a totally new idea about how this, these are uh, energetically structured to maximize the electrostatic field. So what's happening is this is complex one, complex three, four, and five. Protons are pumped out into the um, uh, lumen of the Christi. And then if that uh, electrostatic field gets too great, it would explode the Christi. But it turns out that the adenucleotide translocator not only exchanges ATP and ADP, but we now have shown is a voltage-dependent ion proton channel, so that when the membrane potential gets too high, it opens the channel and the protons flow back in to create then uh, um, a electro electrical loop. And this just shows in our ANT knockout mouse, we as we add uh, increase the patch clamp voltage, we do not see an increase in uh, proton transfer, but in the wild type we do. So then that leads the idea that as mitochondria come together, we have these Christi lumen, which have all the protons, they're um, repelling each other. The adenonucleotide transoc here is, here is exchanging the ATP. These are the ATP synthases that are making the ATP. But all the translocators here are acting as pressure overload valves, and that's then creating an oscillation of a current within these uh, systems. And we're very interested in whether this is a communication system that might be used. Um, and that's part of our interest in the physics of mitochondria. But anyway, moving along then to the genetics, if we then put energetics in the middle of disease rather than anatomy, then we can argue that all the common diseases have the same pathophysiological mechanism. That is partial defect in energetics. It could be due to nuclear mutations or changes in their expression in the epigenome. It can be due to ancient adaptive polymorphisms or recent deleterious mutations. Uh, it can be uh, changes in your diet or whether you exercise or whether you're exposed to toxins. Do you inhibit the mitochondrial function? 
you'll inhibit mitochondrial replication, you'll increase mitochondrial DNA damage, and that will erode energetics, and that's aging, and why their diseases have a delayed onset and progressive course, and the diseases that are going to be affected are the neuropsychiatric, heart, muscle, and renal, because these are high energy issues. If you block the uh, energetic system and you keep adding fuel, that is carbohydrates and fats, they'll build up in your bloodstream, and that's what metabolic syndrome is. And if you damage the mitochondria and release the, damage the cell and release the mitochondria, then you'll activate the inflammatory system, and that's why all of these common diseases have inflammation. So we think then this gives a coherent theory for why all of the complex diseases can be understood and why we haven't understood them by the anatomical and Mendelian paradigms. So this is a pedigree we studied in the early 1980s. Uh, this woman had lactic acidosis and growth rate dardation. These are the uh, individuals we could study that were alive at the time. Lactic acidosis, growth like rep, growth retardation, progressive dementia, stroke-like episodes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cardiac conduction defects. The oxidative muscle fibers degenerated. The glycolytic muscle fibers were fine. They make abnormal mitochondria. This is called ragged red fibers or mitochondrial myopathy. And all these unfortunate men and women died in the late teens or early 20s of either heart failure or deep seizures. Now, they had a mutation in the tRNA uh, leucine gene at 3243, A to G, and they were all about 70% mutant, giving maternal transmission of this lethal disease. But what's astonishing is if you have 10 to 30% mutant, you'll get type 1 or type 2 diabetes or autism, and if you have 100% mutant, you'll die of Lee syndrome or perinatal lethality. So how could exactly the same mutation with just different percentages of plasma give totally distinct clinical phenotypes? And that was a big puzzle that we had. So what we did is we took a cell which didn't have its own mitochondria, we cured of its mitochondria, but had a nucleus, and then we put in the cytoplasm of one of these patients that was heteroplasmic for this 3243 mutation. So then we could make clones that had different percentages of the mutation with exactly the same nucleus. So then we could ask, what did the effect of changing the mitochondrial genotype have on the cellular physiology and gene expression. And these are all transcription factors that we can deduce from RNA sequence analysis of these uh, uh, cell lines. And you can see the diabetes uh, percentage mutant had this transcriptional factor profile. The neurodegenerative disease has this profile. Lethal childhood disease has this profile. And a cell with no mitochondrial DNA has this profile. Or if you plot it by principal component analysis, this is normal, this is diabetes and autism, this is neurodegenerative disease, lethal childhood disease, and cell with no mitochondrial DNA. So what does that mean? You can have a continuum of bioenergetic change, but you get discrete phase-like changes in nuclear gene expression. And those phase-like changes in nuclear gene expression are what is defining the patient's phenotype. Okay. So then how do we understand how the mitochondrial DNA genotype is causing these phase changes in the nuclear gene expression? And so what we did is we took advantage of the fact, uh, or the idea, that if you alter oxidative phosphorylation, you're going to affect the tricarboxylic acid cycle. You're going to then affect these intermediates, and these are intermediates that are involved by all the enzymes that are used in modifying the epigenome to modify the histones, and modified histones would then alter the gene expression pattern and feedback on the mutation. So the question is, is that true? So what we used is um, uh, carbon-13 glucose, fully labeled carbon-13 glucose, beautiful water, bottle of water, um, and, oh, thank you very much, that's right. Um, Excellent. So um, we use uh, carbon-13 glucose. That's going to be um, metabolized in the cultured cybrid cells into pyruvate. Pyruvate is going to go in to make acetyl-CoA, which will condense with oxaloacetate to give you citrate. <coughs> citrate is exported by the citrate transporter, <coughs> and there, there at, outside the ATP citrate lyase will convert it back to acetyl-CoA, and we surmise that the acetyl-CoA was the substrate for the histone uh, acetyltransferases to modify the histones. So the question is, is that true? So here are uh, the amount of the glucose carbons that go into acetyl-CoA 
in a cell line with no mutant mitochondrial DNAs or 100% mutant mitochondrial DNAs. And you can see that presenting the mutant mitochondrial DNAs reduced the flux of carbon into acetyl-CoA. If we now use an inhibitor of mitochondrial ribosomes, chloramphenicol, we can completely block any flow of acetyl-CoA from glucose uh, into the cytoplasm. And if we wash out the chloramphenicol, it goes back up to normal. So then the question is, does that affect the histone acetylation? So this shown in yellow are the C13 going into histones. And you can see at 0%, there's quite a lot of uh, the uh, uh, glucose going into acetyl-CoA on the histones. Then if we have 100%, it goes down. 0% completely blocks the flow of acetyl-CoA to histones. And we wash out the carbon chloramphenicol, and it goes back up. So what that says is, all of the acetyl-CoA necessary for modifying the nuclear histones is coming directly through citrate in the mitochondria. Therefore, the mitochondria is regulating the acetylation of the histones. Another alternative would be looking at a compound alpha-ketoglutarate. Now, <clears throat> the mitochondrial DNA, of course, is going to run the respiratory chain, and then the respiratory chain is going to convert glucose to alpha-ketoglutarate. That's part of the TCA cycle. Alpha-ketoglutarate is the substrate for the Dimanji uh, demethylases, and that takes then the methyl group off of histones. So if alpha-ketoglutarate goes down, then demethylation will be failed and methylation will go up. So what we would see is the reciprocal of alpha-ketoglutarate going down and uh, methylation going up. So here's looking at C14, glucose going to alpha-ketoglutarate. Here's a 0%, 100%, chloramphenicol wipes it out. Chloramphenicol uh, removed goes back up. And if we then look what happens when we have chloramphenicol, we see methylation goes up. Or if we look across all the percentages of different mutants, um, then the alpha ketoglutarate starts low at 0%, gets higher at 50%, and then goes to almost zero at 100%, and the reciprocal is seen for the methylation. Or if we look at acetylation, it's pretty constant throughout till about 75%, and then it declines, and so does acetylation. So the point of that is that it's exactly the mitochondria that's regulating all the substrates for managing the uh, regulation of the histones and their modifications. So if that's true then, we should see a very different profile of acetylations of histones from the cell lines with 0% or 100%. And here you can see that this is what we've done now is taken the histones out of all the cybrids isolated the histones, digested them with protease, run that all in a mass spectrometer, and get all of the modifications uh, that are there. And you can see that the modifications at 0% are fundamentally different from those at 100%. What's even more interesting is if you now do complete metabolomics uh, versus all the different percentages of mutant versus all of the different modifications, what we found is 150 discrete histone modifications that were directly regulated by mitochondrial genotope type and the associated um, intermediate metabolism. So we believe these are the key signatures that tell the nucleus what kind of metabolic state it should be in based on its energetic profile, and that that's then how we get the changes from one phenotype to the next. So then the question is, how would that regulation of those metabolism be monitored by oxidative phosphorylation. Well, remember, oxidative phosphorylation oxidizes NADH to NAD. So we then thought, well, what is the relationship between NAD to NADH ratio and these phenomena? So now this is the work of Patrick uh, Schaefer, and he uses a system called NADH uh, autofluorescence lifetime microscopy, and he can actually then look at the NADH level by um, in its intrinsic autofluorescence. So now he's looking at the autofluorescence of NADH in the mitochondria of these cells. And you can see that the color is pretty constant all the way up to 70%, and then at 90 and 100% at a row zero, it changes radically. Or if you then plot the NAD to NADH ratio, it's constant up to 70%, and then it falls off. If you now correlate that with acetyl-CoA, it goes up to 70% and falls off and acetylation of histones up to 70% and down. So what's happening is 
as long as the mitochondria can maintain the NAD to NADH ratio, the TCA cycle continues to evolve, process, citrate is generated, acetyl-CoA is made, and that regulates the nucleus. Okay, but if now look, if you look at the NADH ratio of the nucleus, then you see a very different pattern. It's high here, the NAD is high here, the NADH gets um, more increased here, then the NAD goes back up, and then uh, NADH comes predominant. Or if you plot it this way, here's high NAD, then it becomes more reduced, then the NAD goes back up, and then goes back down. And why is that amazing? Because this is exactly the transcription profile of the mitochondrial DNA genes. High at 0%, uh, down at 20 to 30%, which is diabetes, up at 70%, uh, which is neurodegenerative disease, down at 100% lethal disease. So the question is, how can the NAD level go up when the NADH level is rising? Well, the answer is because the nucleus tries to make more NAD by biosynthesis. So this peak is due to the de novo synthesis of NAD that the nucleus is trying to do to compensate for this energetic defect. And that's then the switch between diabetes and neurodegenerative disease. So now what we can do is we can take all of these different factors and we can plot them across the genotype. And what we see is there's a discrete set of signals that define each of the different uh, pathologic states. Normal, diabetes and autism, uh, neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, and then lethal childhood disease. So we think we're now beginning to understand this phenomena, but more excitingly, if we can then modulate the NAD to NADH ratio or the substrates, we could um, modulate the position on this curve and treat the disease. So moving then on to uh, some classic phenotypes, this is a pedigree um, where the individuals have a mutation in the ND6 gene of complex 1. And that changes proline to 25, at codon 25 to leucine. This is a fairly highly conserved proline across evolutionary time down to zebrafish. This individual of the pedigree has 50% mutant in her blood, and she had cerebellar uh, ataxia and optic atrophy, kind of blindness. Her sister had only 5% mutant and was perfectly normal. But each of her consorts, she had children, and every one of the children was 100% mutant, and they all died of Lee syndrome. So that shows how rapidly this heteroplasmy can segregate across both mitosis and meiosis to give very different clinical phenotypes. Now, we wanted to make sure that we understood the pathophysiology of this mutation, so we decided to make a mouse that had that mutation. So what we do is we take cultured cells, we mutagenize the mitochondrial DNA, we then sequence the mitochondrial DNA and find those that have interesting mutants. So I'm going to talk about one mutation that has the ND6 proline to 25 to leucine, another mutation with cytochrome oxidase, uh, valine 421 to alanine, and just mixing two normal mitochondrial DNAs. So what we do now is we take those cells, we remove the nucleus, take the cytoplasmic fragment, we made a female pluripotent embryonic stem cell, cell removed its mitochondria with rhodamine 6G, fused in the mutant mitochondria, so now we have the pluripotent nucleus with the mutant mitochondrial DNA, put it in a blastocyst, put it in a foster mother, get chimeras, breed the chimeras, picking up the mutant. So, to make a long story short, this is the uh, CO1 valine 421 to alanine, a 50% reduction in cytochrome oxidase. They get cardiomyopathy with fibrosis, and as they age, they get type 2 diabetes with uh, resistance to uh, glucose challenge and insulin resistance. Interestingly enough, the ND6 mutant does not have the diabetes phenotype. On the other hand, if we look at the ND6 proline 25 to leucine, we have then about a 60% reduction in respiratory complex 1. And what that does is it greatly increases the reactive oxygen species production, and that results in neurodegenerative disease. So de even though there are both mutations of the mitochondrial DNA, they're giving totally different phenotypes, totally different biochemistries. Now, one of the interesting things about uh, this system is that it affects the immune system. And the reason for that is the immune system works on T regulatory and T effector cells. So T effector cells do all the job of killing things, and T regulatory cells keep the T effector cells from killing you. So what um, Alicia Angelin in our group did was to look at the biochemistry of T regulatory and T effector cells. 
And what she found is that the T regulatory cells were highly oxidative, this so-called seahorse graph showing a high oxygen consumption, whereas the T effector cells were basically glycolytic. So these two cells have totally different energetic capacity. Now, what was interesting about that is as the ND6 mouse ages, the, um, because of the chronic oxidative stress, it ultimately kills off the oxidative cells, which are the T regulatory cells. And what that means then is you create an imbalance with more T effector cells, less T regulatory cells, hence more inflammation. And that inflammation works through this amazing uh, system by which the mitochondria directly regulates the innate immune system. So what happens is the mitochondrial DNA becomes oxidized by that oxidative stress. And the oxidized mitochondrial DNA can go in two ways. It's released from the mitochondria. In one case, it binds to what's called the inflammasome. And that drives then the formation of uh, uh, catalyte, uh, caspase, which activates these enzymes that drives NF-kappa B, the big inflammation system. The other thing that it does is it binds to sea gas, and sea gas creates cyclic GAMP that interacts with sting, and sting goes through these transcription factors to interact and upregulate the interferon system. So what this means is, as the mitochondrial oxidative stress goes up, the whole inflammation system is increased, and that's why all these diseases have a chronic inflammatory component, but also how inflammation is regulated when infection occurs, mitochondrial inhibited, more ROS is generated, more inflammation. So now the whole thing becomes organized around bioenergetics. Now here's another case where we actually mix two normal mitochondrial DNAs together from a 129 mouse and an NZB mouse. They're about as different as an Eskimo and a Khoisan from South Africa. So here we have the mouse with the two mitochondrial DNAs. We segregate out the NZB to 129, segregate out the 129 to NZB, and we keep the heteroplasmic animal. And then we just ask, does having two mitochondrial DNAs make a difference? Why did Mother Nature have maternal inheritance? So if you put a mouse in a chamber, it's active at night, then quiet day, active at night. And so the 129 animals, active at night, not at day, active at night. NZB, active at night, not at day, active at night. But the heteroplasmic animals just sit there. They're totally depressed. Okay, so do they have another phenotype? phenotype. So this is a so-called Barnes maze. It's probably hard for you to see, but this is a, a platform with many holes around the outer edge. And we have then different color panels so that the mouse can orient. Behind this one hole, there's a little black box. All the other holes drop to the floor. So you put the mouse in the middle of the uh, platform, and it wants to hide. So it looks at all the different holes until it figures out where the little black box is and jumps in. So over time, it'll learn by using the colors where the black hole is, a little box is, and it'll, over each successive day, it will get better at finding the hole. So that's true for the NZB, for the 129, and for the heteroplasmic animal. But now, take two days off. Actually, Megan took a weekend off, but she didn't tell me. But anyway, she took two days off, and she did experiment again. So she put the 129 animal in the uh, platform, and it ran and found the hole. Fine. Put the NZB animal, ran found the hole. Perfect. Put the heteroplasmic animal, had no long-term memory. So simply mixing two mitochondrial DNAs wiped out long-term memory. No wonder Mother Nature doesn't like men. So anyway, the point of this is the reason we have uniparental inheritance is this system is so sensitive that we cannot tolerate even a small percentage of reduction in energetics, and this proves that that's the case. Okay, so how does this relate to the other bacteria? So there are 10 to the 17th bacteria in your cells, 10 to the 14th bacteria in your gut. Do they talk to each other? And the answer is yes. So this is a work of Tal Yardini, and here what we see are the genotypes 129, the heteroplasmic animal, and NZB. And this is an uh, indication of the overall bacterial composition of the gut. And you could see this beautiful relationship. As the more NZB, the less complex the bacterial diversity. Or if you look at the NZB, ND6 mouse versus its control, again, lower diversity. Now what do these NZB and 129 have in common? They both make more ROS more reactive oxygen species. So if we then allow the animal, an animal to age, it's going to accumulate more oxidative damage, and lo and behold, the diversity goes down. 
But if we then put an antioxidant enzyme catalase into the mitochondria, then we reverse that effect, and now the um, diversity goes up. So there's a direct relationship between mitochondrial ROS production and the microbiome. That is, the mitochondria is conversing with the bacteria in your gut. And we believe that's through this oxidized mitochondrial DNA through the sting and sea gas and inflammatory pathways. And this just shows a summation of all the different relationships that have given that relationship. So now we have all the bacteria communicating with each other. Okay, so now moving on to a, a very famous pedigree. This was pedigree, first pedigree I really worked up with a kind of blindness, labor's apathy. You can see that these people went blind and they're all related to the maternal lineage, but there's variable expressivity, different percentages of people go blind. So these people are pure mutant homoplasmic for this mutation, 11778. And there's a four to one male to female bias. So why would some pedigrees have more blind people, some people have less? And it turns out that what matters is the nature of the mutation to cause the blindness and the background mitochondrial DNA on which the mutation occurred. So here are three classic mutations that can give blindness. Uh, complex 1 genes, 3460, 11778, 14484. This is severe, intermediate, and mild. Yeah, so you would think that a very mild mutation would have very little penetrance. So how does it, how does it occur that this has more blindness? Well, it turns out to go blind, if you have this severe mutation, it doesn't matter what mitochondrial DNA background you're on. But for this intermediate one, then this lineage we call J is a important factor in increasing your risk of going blind. And if you have this mild mutation, you almost have to have this lineage J. So lineage J is augmenting the in new mutation to give you blindness. So then the question is, what are these mitochondrial DNA lineages that are modifying de novo mutations? And that gets back to studies we did many years ago where we actually went to around the world to indigenous populations and we sequenced their mitochondrial DNAs. And the idea was that, just as I told you, if we could sequence the mitochondrial DNA of any one individual compared to any other individual, we would know their maternal relationship. So by looking at populations, we could reconstruct how each population was related to each other, and therefore the origin and migration of women. So basically, we found that mitochondrial DNA coalesces back to a mitochondrial DNA about 200,000 years ago in the Khoisan of the South Africa. We call that lineage L0. L1 and L2 are two different pygmy lineages. And then in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, L3 gave rise to a lineage that colonized all the Bantus. And then in Ethiopia, L3 gave rise to two lineages, M and N. And only two mitochondrial DNAs left Africa and colonized all the rest of the world. M left Africa and stayed along the tropics all the way down to Australia, and then much later acquired mutations to move into Asia to give lineages like C, D, G, and a whole bunch of Ms. Whereas N moved directly into the temperate zone to give lineages like H, uh, H J, T, U, V, W, these are just letters, and then moved laterally into the temperate zone to give Asian lineages. So Europe has only N, whereas Asia has both M and N. And then later, um, Lineage A from N and C and D from M became enriched in Chukotka, crossed the Bering Land Bridge, and colonized the Americas. So this is really remarkable. Why do mitochondrial DNA lineages correlate dramatically with geographic origin, whereas nuclear variation is panmictic? That is, just varies in frequency around the world. And the reason is here, in Africa, if you want to survive and reproduce as a woman, you need to run away from lions. Running away from lions means you need to have a maximum amount of calories into ATP and the minimum amount of heat because it's hot. And so then you have tightly coupled mitochondria. But up here in the Arctic, the lions froze to death. So then what's the problem for you? You're going to freeze to death. So what happens? You get mutations in your mitochondrial DNA, you become less efficient at oxidative phosphorylation, and now you burn more calories for the same amount of ATP, but now you maintain your core body temperature for that cold stress. And so, in fact, up here then, all these people are eating a very high-fat diet, and that then uh, is very pathologic to people here that can't manage that high-fat diet. And that then results in this disparity uh, between genotypes and physiology. 
So at every branch of the mitochondrial DNA tree, and this is just a small part of a European tree, there, at each branch there is a change in a key function in the mitochondrial DNA. So let's just look at this J lineage that amplifies labors. This J1 is a mutation in cytochrome B at 14798. That mutation is conserved, uh, affects coenzyme Q binding sites, conserved in all mesozoan animals. This mutation, 15257 in cytochrome B, is conserved all the way to E. coli. Yet these two variants are polymorphic in this population. So that's totally different from what you've been told. Whereas if you're something is highly evolutionarily conserved, it should be uniform within any one population. But these are adaptive variants that change our energetics based on our environmental needs and therefore are polymorphic. Okay, so what is the effect of these different lineages on our human health? So this is a study that um, the uh, AC Cura um, helps support. And here what we're looking at then is mitochondrial Asian lineages as they relate to diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And these lineages, uh, D5, F4, and N9A, they are protective. This odds ratio, when it's less than one, is protective of diabetes. That is, other lineages that are at increased risk of diabetes. Whereas this lineage, F4 and N9A, are at increased risk for hypertension. Here their odds ratios are two to three. And this lineage, um, uh, F4, is at greatly increased risk for obesity. So now we have ancient lineages that are predisposing people to environmental challenges of their diet that create these metabolic syndrome. Now this is particularly interesting because one pedigree that we found has this maternal transmission of diabetes and it had a mutation in the 3243 gene. Remember I told you that 10 to 30 percent 3243 gives you diabetes but these people had 88 percent mutant. They should have died of neurodegenerative disease but they only had diabetes. How come? Because they were all N9A, and N9A cut in half the risk of diabetes. So the mitochondrial background was now protective of the de novo mutation, and that gave them diabetes. This is a mutation that occurred in Europe, changes this tRNA A to G, and it's found in only 0.4% of young people, but in Alzheimer's it's 3%, Parkinson's 5%, ADPD at 6%, and so this is a maternal inher inherited homoplasmic variant that predisposes, predisposes people to late onset Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And these are different European lineages that I mentioned, and they are now correlated with autism, childhood autism. And this then, autism is about fourfold more common in males and females, just like labors. And you can see that these European lineages have odds ratios close to two, are almost as important, half as important, as male versus female. But what's really remarkable, if you add all these lineages up, that's 55% of the European population. So the total risk of the mitochondrial DNA for autism for the mitochondrial DNA is infinitely more impressive than all the nuclear genes that have been found after tens of millions of dollars have been spent. And yet nobody ever thought to look at the mitochondrial DNA. Okay, so we're now gonna change gears just a little bit are you having fun? I'm exhausted. Uh, anyway, we're going to look at the... That was supposed to be funny. Anyway, never mind. Okay, so now we're going to look at a nuclear encoded gene, the adenine nucleotide translocator. It exchanges ATP and ADP across the intermediate membrane. But there are three isoforms, four in humans. ANT1 is in the heart, muscle, and brain. ANT2 is systemic. Okay, so this is a mutation of a deletion of one of the nucleotides in ANT1 on chromosome 4. And this occurred 500 years ago, and it carried as a recessive nuclear gene mutation uh, in these uh, religious isolate over many, many generations. And then these heterozygous men and women found each other. Uh, they gave rise to homozygous individuals that get cardiomyopathy. What's remarkable about this is these people in blue and gray have atrophic cardiomyopathy, whereas these individuals in blue have fulminated, dilated cardiomyopathy, and die in childhood without heart transplant. So how could exactly the same mutation give to two totally different phenotypes? Well, before we address that question, what we did is we took cell lines, skin fibroblasts, converted them to induced pluripotent stem cells, and then converted those into cardiomyocytes. And then we could actually look at the cardiomyocyte heartbeat of the cells. And what you can see is that the normal heartbeats are very uniform, whereas the mutant cell lines are highly dysrhythmic. 
So this energetic defect has caused cardiac dysrhythmia. Now the question is then, why did So why, why did um, some of the individuals get hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and others get dilated cardiomyopathy? And it turns out those with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have European lineage H, whereas those with the dilated cardiomyopathy have European lineage U, and that has a nucleotide change in the TRNA leucine gene and in the 16S ribosomal RNA. So the mitochondrial partial ener energetic defect augmented the nuclear mutation, creating the more severe phenotype. So we wanted to model that. We could make a mouse that has the uh, ANT knocked out. It gets then a proliferation <clears throat> of the mitochondria <clears throat> with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The wild type hearts have very consistent heartbeats. The mutant hearts are highly dysrhythmic, just as we saw in the people. So now we can take wild type um, CO1, ND6 mutant animals, ANT, and then mix the CO1 with the ANT and the ND6 with the ANT. And what do we get? So um, if you look at uh, this panel, what we have here is the wild type mouse, the CO1 mouse, the ND6 mouse, ANT mouse has premature aging, the ND6 mouse is even worse, but note that the CO1 mouse is protected. If we look at the longevity, these are all the different strains, but the ND6 ANT has a 50% reduction in lifespan. So that's exactly what we saw with the haplogroup U and the ANT in the humans. So if we now look at the hearts, wild type, CO1, ND6, ANT, ANT, CO1, ANT, ND6, you now see the severe dilated cardiomyopathy. So what is happening here? Well, ND6 changes a polypeptide on this first enzyme of uh, the respiratory chain called respiratory complex one. And that's gonna reduce the specific activity of complex one. So here you can see the specific activity is reduced. But what was remarkable is we found that the ANT, for some reason, reduced the amount of complex one. So now we had an effect where the ANT was reducing the amount of complex one, and the ND6 was reducing its specific activity. And the two together was creating an augmented effect on complex one. So what that does is it greatly increases the reactive oxygen species production and the oxidative damage of this combined system. And that then completely alters the structure of the membrane, intermembrane structure of the mitochondria. So this is the ANT, which disrupts the Christie structure. If we put the CO1 in, it restructures, restores the Christie structure. But if we put the ND6, it does not restore the Christie structure and fragments the mitochondria. So that's the uh, complementary effect. And that's due to the activation by Ross of this enzyme OMA1, which now cleaves OPA1 and opens these Christi lumen, like I told you. So it's now decouplized the mitochondria by breaking those Christi lumen uniform groups. So what that means now is these mitochondria are very sensitive to calcium-induced damage, and this is looking at the activation of the permeability transition pore. Remember, it's a closed door. When it's too much calcium, it opens up and short circuits the membrane potential. So now we're going to add calcium fluxes until ultimately we pop the pore. But note when we have the ANT and ND6, the pore is much more sensitive to activation and thus the cells are being destroyed prematurely by the interaction of the ANT and the ND6. And if we just look then at the ejection fraction of the heart or the lifespan as the amount of um, uh, interaction of ANT and uh, ND6 goes up, the, the animals prematurely age and get an early onset uh, death. So last point to be made is that this is not just about the heart, it's also about the brain. So here um, in your brain you have two kinds of neurons, an a excitatory neuron called a glutamatergic neuron and an inhibitory neuron called a gabinergic neuron. And these interact with each other to give you this balance, the brain waves that you have that's critical for intelligence. Well, it turns out the glutamatergic neurons are born at the base of the developing brain and migrate uh, radially, whereas the uh, gabinergic neurons are born at the uh, end of the brain and migrate tangentially. So it takes a lot more energy to do this than to do this. And what happens is then you get an imbalance. So if we have the ANT wild type and ANT mutant, here's the ANT wild type and the 
uh, inner neurons are migrating tangentially along the cortex, as you can see. But if we knock out ANT, the neurons get lost. They don't have enough energy to find their way. And you can get that with an inhibitor called um, von Crickic acid. So when, would that be also true of a mouse that had a defect in mitochondrial function? And here again, we're back to the ND6 mouse, and we're looking at a phenomena where the mouse shows an obsessive compulsive behavior, and you can see the ND ND6 mouse has the obsessive compulsive behavior, and it has a significant um, effect in social interaction. Therefore, this mouse is pre-autism. So what we've got now is the effect on the brain circuitry in development giving autism, thus bringing us together with the mitochondrial mutations that we showed in autism. So then the last point to be made is that we can take each of these animals and we can ask how it responds to stress. So now what we're going to do is put the mouse into a centrifuge tube, 50 mil tube, for 30 minutes. That's about the equivalent of my thinking about writing an NIH grant. So anyway, the mouse is then stressed for just a few minutes, and then we release it. But then we ask, what's its physiological state? So we can see that the ND6 mouse, the um, corticosterone levels are higher than the ND6, I mean, than the CO1 and the N, uh, wild type. But more, really interestingly, if we look at uh, wild type and then look at ANT, ANT has this huge response for stress hormones, whereas the NNT mutation is completely flat. If we look at uh, catecholamines, we can see that there's a big effect on catecholamines for the CO1, and that the ANT mouse is already saturated in the flight fight response hormones. So what I'm trying to make point here is these mice look all absolutely the same. They're all black six mice. You couldn't tell the difference, but they have totally different personalities based on these subtle mitochondrial energetic defects. So the point is that very subtle changes in energetics have a huge effect on phenotypes, and those are the phenotypes that nobody ever tested for and nobody ever found in disease. So in the last point to be made, we think that the mitochondria is the integrator between the environmental challenges, nuclear genetic variation, mitochondrial variation. If energetic uh, environment challenges the mitochondria, it then perturbs mitochondrial metabolism, changes the mitochondrial signaling through the um, NADH and the small metabolites, changes the epigenome to reconstitute the nuclear and mitochondrial gene expression to maintain energetic homeostasis and health. But if there's a nuclear mutation, a mitochondrial mutation, or a severe environmental effect, then this feedback system fails, we get energetic decline, and we get disease and death. And now we think we have a coherent theory for all the common diseases, and therefore something we can do about them. And I just want to um, uh, mention all the great people. Here is my colleague, Prasant Patlori, who made uh, this visit here together with uh, A. Pura and his uh, colleague, VJ. Thank you both very much. Thank you all. But also, um, Martin and Megan, who did a lot of the mouse work. Uh, uh, Tal, who did the work on the um, microbiome. Um, Piotrick, who did the work on the nucleocytoplasmic interaction. Uh, Larry and uh, Demetra, who did the uh, population genetics, and Alicia, who did the work on the immunological work, and then all the other team that are critical for this work. Thank you very much. Also, sorry, sorry for the technical error that he has. Uh, thank you, Douglas, for the thank you. wonderful talk. I'm sure the last one hour, although he has uh, gone with a jet speed, <laughs> him, and otherwise he would not have been able to. He would not have covered as many aspects as he has covered in the talk, starting from the role of these, the how the energetics is important, and then talking about the endosymbiont the hypothesis and symbiont theory, how these uh, maternal inheritance and how these organelles, the so-called the once upon a time bacteria, have become so important in disease, so nicely described for us. Thank you very much, and I'm sure you would be willing to take a few questions. I'd be honored. Yes. 
Okay, there is one already at the very last. Anybody else here? Otherwise, the last boy, the, the, the first one who raised his hand. Yeah, we'll come to you. Hello. I have a couple of questions. It's a wonderful start on. <clears throat> it's a wonderful and very insightful talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, recently, I was uh, reading about uh, biparental uh, mitochondrial inheritance. I would like your comments on that. Right. And the second thing is, uh, this mitochondria are destroyed. Paternal mitochondria are destroyed. Right. So how? How are these actually identified for degradation? Yeah, so um, first, uh, let's do the second one first. So how, how does the paternal mitochondrial um, import get destroyed in the egg? Um, and uh, you would think that that would be the first question everybody would want to answer, but we don't really have a very uh, coherent set of data on that. We do know that in mammals, the male mitochondrial uh, outer proteins are ubiquinated, and we know that the proteasome will attack those outer membrane proteins, and that may signal degradation of the. Oh, I'm sorry, you want yeah. to come? How, yes, but how does it distinguish maternal, uh, maternal and paternal mitochondria? So the, the, the egg mitochondria are not ubiquinated, the male mitochondria are. And so then the male mitochondria are seen as, as um, targets for the proteasome. But interestingly enough, in fish, uh, there's actually seems to be a restriction modification system that actually attacks the mitochondrial DNA. And then um, in uh, C. elegans, it seems that there one of the uh, new enzymes in the intermembrane space, which normally is released to go into the nucleus to degrade the DNA, is released into the cytoplasm to degrade the, to degrade the mitochondrial DNA. What, whether all of those work on humans, how that all works, uh, we still uh, really don't know. So, first of all, understand that 99% of all the effort in the world has been put on one of the two organisms in human biology, the nuclear cytosol. So, here is a whole life form that is essentially unexplored. This is tremendous opportunity to understand things that we don't understand at all. So, then there is a paper. Uh, published in PNAS, suggesting that in some cases, very rarely, you can get biparental inheritance. And then the question is, uh, how did that occur? Um, basically, the paper doesn't say. Um, one possibility, of course, is that there's a leakage of this system. Um, another possibility is that there is a different way that uh, mitochondrial DNA could be, say, put in the nucleus and transmitted. So right now, we're still waiting um, some of us are still interested in trying to figure that out. But that turns out to be relatively rare. We've not seen, uh, there's only two papers that have suggested biparental inheritance. So uh, that's where we're at on that. Thank you. Yeah, that boy in the corner. Yeah. Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, I just want to know, like, uh, in the, you said that in, uh, in pyruvate, when it goes to the STL coenzyme and helps in the acetylation of the genomic DNA. So, I would just like to know the uh, what is the scene, uh, that what is the scenario in the cancerous cell when most of the pyruvate is get uh, switched to the production of lactate, and whether it is any correlation uh, is there, like uh, any report which says like it is particular to the oncogenes or something. Um, so, are you are we talking about the transfer of genes from the mitochondria to the nucleus, and what the nuclear genes are doing, and how that relates to cancer? Is that is that no no the, uh, the pyruvate when it goes to the ester uh, coenzyme? Uh, yeah. So, in the cancer cell, you're asking about lactate versus pyruvate. Yes. Okay. Um, so why, so if I understand then the question, there was a fellow named Otto Warburg, yes. and he noted that in many solid tumors, um, they did what he called aerobic glycolysis. That is, they used oxygen, but they also made a lot of lactate. So that was very puzzling, because you would have thought that to use oxygen, you would go from glucose to pyruvate and then through uh, the TCA cycle to then generate the hydrogen to on the electron transport chain to use the oxygen. So how could you generate so much lactate? 
Um, well, it turns out that um, it's now clear uh, that you need glycolysis to generate a lot of the acetyl-CoA that you need to make lipids. And cancer cells are growing really, really fast. So in fact, they, they upregulate glycolysis to drive this pathway to make both energetics, but also to make these intermediates for cancer biogenesis. So the current idea is there's a, re a regulation of nuclear gene expression that affects these key intermediates at the base of the, TCA, uh, of the glycolytic cycle that increases this flux rate through glycolysis to give enough uh, of the acetyl-CoA to drive both um, um, biogenesis as well as energetics. So one of the things that really um, caused problems in, in the field for many, many years is in the 50s and 60s, maybe even into the 70s, um, people thought that cancer cells had defective mitochondria, and therefore they spent a lot of time studying what, they, what was the defect in the mitochondria so they could cure it. Well, they, some cancer cells do have altered mitochondria, that's not a question, but it, that wasn't the reason for the, um, for the Warburg effect. Um, the Warburg effect is actually due to the rapid proliferation of the cells. So, all that said, there's a whole exciting biology of mitochondrial DNA mutation in cancer, and uh, one of the most remarkable things is that many of the same mutations that we found in people as they migrate around the world and adapted to different environments, those exact same nucleotide changes are occurring de novo in cancer cells and allowing the cancer cells to adapt to environments within our body. So one of the uh, out of Africa changes that I didn't neglected to mention um, is a mutation in the, uh, what's called the ND3 gene at 10398 nucleotide. And that amino acid change um, is associated with uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, a whole bunch of other things like that as a lineage, out of Africa lineage. But if you look at prostate cancer, when it metastasizes in the bone, even though the original person didn't have that 10398 mutation, 70% of all the bone metastases acquire exactly that same mutation. So the idea is that these adaptive mutations are adaptive not only between populations, but also with cells within different environments. And I think oh, there's an exciting new cancer biology field in how energetics is adapting to environments as well. So it's very relevant, but not quite the way Warburg thought. Yeah. Um, so David, here, in that uh, so I, it's a very insightful talk. So I have a couple of questions. So the first one is, uh, does the complexity of, uh, you talk of the etiology of uh, diseases related to mitochondrial DNA and uh, such associated diseases, is it related to the quantitativeness or the semi-autonomy of the mitochondrial DNA? It doesn't have full control. So that is one. So what is your comment on that? Uh, additionally, so also you talk about the precision of bioenergetics. So I'm interested to know how does it balance that precision of bioenergetics that leads to a particular, you know, very specific phenotypes? Because you talk, there's a, there's a mix going on there. So yeah, comment on that as well. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with the first question again. So the complexity, sir, the complexity of the etiology of such diseases, is it because it's quantitative and semi-autonomy of the mitochondrial DNA? Um, so, um, if I understand your question, the genetic complexity of these diseases is due to the fact that we're talking about an, a whole system, an organism. And that organism has an entire biology, a separate biology. And so there are many aspects of its physiology that are, are interacting on our health. And they can be modulated by one to 2,000 nuclear genes, thousands of copies of the mitochondrial DNA, each mutation of which can have a slightly different effect on the physiology, and then these are interacting with each other. For example, one of, one of the things we commonly see in clinic is mutation in the nuclear encoded gene for mitochondrial DNA replication. So that nuclear mutation then causes damage to the mitochondrial DNA. So now you get maternal inheritance of multiple mitochondrial DNA deletions. So yes, the complexity of these diseases is due to the multiple different kinds of genes, how they interact, and the complexity of the biochemistry and how that relates to physiology. So that's why this whole class of diseases really was never appreciated because 
everybody wanted to think of one gene, one polypeptide, one disease, where now I think of it as, as a system for which there are many different imports and a few outputs like health. And so we need to be thinking about treating the system, not all the different inputs. So that's my thought on one. So what was the second one? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so you talk of precision of bioenergetics. So I'm interested to know how does it balance that precision of bioenergetics, which leads to a particular phenotype? Like it may be multiple phenotypes, but how, how is that balance maintained? Probably no, but uh, yeah. Just ask. So, um, if I understand your thought, um, where our thoughts are now is that the mitochondrial genotype, let's say a heteroplasmic genotype as we have, or anyone, it creates a physiological state in the mitochondria. That physiological state is transposed into the intermediate metabolism and the redox state of the mitochondria. That in turn then changes the physiology of the mitochondria and the small molecules it generates. Those, including ROS, uh, all the intermediate metabolism, redox state, uh, all of those then are signals to the nucleus. And they then define how the epigenome is going to respond. And that epigenomic state creates then the physiological state that creates the phenotype. The reason that idea is important is it then says that that phenotype is malleable. And so if we could just mult modulate the redox state or the intermediate metabolism, we could be able to move that, that, um, that signal to change the epigenomic phase to another phase that's less severe, say change from Alzheimer's disease to diabetes. And that's, that's in fact uh, our goal. And if that's what you're thinking, that's certainly very much what we're trying to do. Right. Somebody will ask it here. Yeah. Um. So the ex beautiful experiment which you showed in the mouse, like uh, in the mouse which did not contain the memory, the two mitochondria. Right. So do you have a sort of explanation for that? Yes, um, we, we would really love to understand that. Um, uh, w that change biochemically is so subtle that when we were studying that intensively, we could not find a definitive reason why, why we could see that effect. But understand that our tools are designed to look at differences of 20, 15 to 20%, like for an enzyme assay. You wouldn't say statistically it was very significant unless it was something fairly large. And I think what we're looking at here are changes that are 5 to 10%. My working hypothesis is that um, these two mitochondrial DNAs have multiple polypeptide um, variants and they're trying to assemble the same respiratory complexes. And so the idea we have is that maybe by trying to put polypeptide A into the complex for where um, the alternative allele should be, you're creating a slight incompatibility. And that might affect what we call super complexes. That is the ability of all these enzymes to work together. Um, we tried to look at super complex structure. At that time, we weren't very successful. But I think that we're getting better at these kinds of tools, and maybe we can find it now. But um, astonishingly, the genetic evidence shows something we can't show biochemically, and that's just because we don't have the tools. Any last question? If, yeah, Sir, Mr. Okay, that may be your, yours, may be the last. Yes. Sir, Mr. First. Uh, I just was wondering, uh, is, do you think there is a possibility, uh, like suppose during a there is an accumulation of various kind of mutation in mitochondria, and there is a correlated accumulation of certain mutation in the nuclear uh, genome as well. That's an excellent question. <clears throat> so the question is, do mitochondrial DNA mutations correlate with aging? Answer, yes. Um, do some, um, I'm going to call them somatic mutations, ones that were not there at conception, but accumulated during development and over time. And we've studied this very intensively in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's disease. And we find in those diseases in the brain, there's a great increase in the frequency of these mitochondrial DNA mutations relative to age match controls. What's remarkable about uh, mutations in normal aging is that each organ acquires the same specific mitochondrial mutation no matter who the person is. So there are organ-specific somatic mutations that acquire during age. So for instance, there's a mutation in the regulatory region at 414 that only acquires in skin fibroblasts with age. 
but everybody that's my age will have that mutation in their skin fibroblast. What's remarkable is in Alzheimer's disease, though you would never see that 414 in the brain of a normal age person, you then see it in the Alzheimer's brains. So there's a clear, a lot of very interesting biology. We have no, absolutely no idea how these mutations get selected for on an organ-specific basis and what their meaning is for things like dementia, um, cardiovascular disease, blindness, and so on. Including the, uh, the decline in the immune uh, response and all those things can be... Closed. It could, uh, could affect the immune system. We see specific mutations in, in uh, white cells. Uh, there's a very famous one, Giuseppe Attardi found at position 150, that is, if you have that in your white cells, and uh, you'll be more likely to be a centenarian than if you don't. I mean, I, it's just amazing, the variation there and what we don't understand about it. I, I just have a very naive question. Oh. What happens to the mitochondria nucleus crosstalk and the dynamics in cells that lack nucleus? For example, red blood cells. Yeah, so um, uh, in, in relation to the red blood cell, they lack both the nucleus and the mitochondria, but the platelets, particularly a cell I'm very fond of, because it has lots of mitochondria, but it's displaced with the nucleus. Um, so I think it's an excellent question. Surprisingly, we know very little about it. Um, we do know that the platelets have a very specific function. Uh, the mitochondria in platelets have a very specific function. Presumably, that's programmed while the nucleus is still there. Um, but then how it's retained and how its function in this whole innate immune system, which we just talked about, how that works, uh, we have very little knowledge. Uh, I wish I could give you a better answer. But those are very, very, just one of the many exciting questions that Well, the, so one argument is that, they, that they, they, they have then short lifespan because they lack the nucleus. I might say they have short lifespan because they lack the mitochondria, but um, yeah, um, th those cells are certainly terminally differentiated and are turned over. Um, and so th th there's a whole biology of stem cells versus post-mitotic cells. Um, again, that's another issue. For instance, if you have a mutation in error-prone mitochondrial DNA polymerase in the nucleus, then you preferentially affect stem cell biology, and that creates an aging phenotype, but not, a, not the same as, as we would get where our post-mitotic cells decline. So there's a lot of biology here that you know, we just don't understand. But thank you for that question. Yeah. I hope it was happy. Yeah, sir, okay. he had, I think one last question. I, the, yeah. uh, the, I'm sure there will be several uh, questions, but this may be the last one after yes. that we yes, have sir. to. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, you have made a very great discovery. And uh, we are very happy to see you here. And you know, I am a graduate student, and uh, we have read many times maternal inheritance from our, you know, uh, many times. And uh, so my question is, uh, there you are talking about citrate, which is playing role of uh, uh, methylation and acetylation. Say again. Citrate molecule is playing role in methylation. Cit citrate. 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 Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So. Uh, do you think the mitochondria, which is a methyl methylation and de uh, acetylation, yeah, demethylation, these all are, are epigenetic modifications. So, uh, do you think this uh, all the epigenetic modifications for a cell uh, controlled by the mitochondria? So that's a, that. So, uh, if I might restate, and then you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. I, I made the case um, that in these cell lines that we looked at, <clears throat> if we block mitochondrial protein synthesis with chloramphenicol we completely block the flow of carbon from glucose into um, uh, acetyl, uh, acetyl groups on histones. And uh, also, uh, we block the uh, alpha ketoglutarate demethylation of the Nemunji demethylases. And our, in this system, if we block mitochondrial function, we stop it. So the, in this system, all of those intermediates are going through the mitochondria. Now, um, to be fair, we haven't looked at every tissue in the body. And so it could well be that, that there are other ways to do this in an organ-specific way. The main point I'm trying to make, though, is that one of the ways that the nuclear epigenome is regulated is through mitochondrial metabolism. Whether that's the only way, that would probably be too strong a statement for a complex organism. But I, I think a very, very valid point that you've made. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm. Uh, it's time for us to put our hands together and say thanks to Douglas for his wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Chancellor, it's yeah. so kind of you to have me. Please have a seat. Now, coming to an end, we would like to thank Professor Wallace for the insightful lecture and sharing his years of research experience and expertise with us. As part of the lecture series, we would now like to uh, felicitate Professor Wallace on behalf of the university and organizing committee. We have all our dignitaries up on the stage. Now, the university would like to felicitate our guest of honor, Professor Wallace. May I request the vice chancellor and dean to do the honor. We request Ma'am Swarnalata to come up onto the dais, please. On behalf of the SP Acure Lab Private and Limited, they would like to facili uh, felicitate Professor Wallace with a memento. Next, they would like to felicitate Professor Apara Podile, Vice Chancellor. Thank you, dignitaries. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Professor Rajagopal, sir, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Thank you. Good evening to all of you. It is my duty to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the organizing committee and university. First, I would like to thank Professor Doug Wallace for all the way coming here and uh, accepting our invitation and giving an excellent talk, uh, wonderful uh, no, in, in, insights. And you have really enlightened us with, our, with your inspiring talk with several mitochondrial and you know, of the discoveries. We really learned many things and our, our particularly our students, so they certainly you know they would have gained a lot. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, it's always our Vice Chancellor is with us and he's very 
encourage encouraging for all kind of scientific activities uh, to conduct in school of life sciences and when i proposed this talk and he you know was very pleased and given his uh, all kind of support and i would like to thank you so much for your you know encouragement and also chairing the session and our dean professor dayananda he is always cooperative and positive when we proposed this seminar he was you know readily agreed and he has given all his support thank you sir for being and accepting you know to conduct this meeting here i thank our pro ashish jakob mr ashish jakob for and he is also his team uh, for coordinating this event and uh, no the this event is happened because of my friend dr prashant is here who is working with him last 15 years a senior scientist and uh, thank you prashant for bringing him here and all the way and also accompanying him and uh, taking care of him you know we are not doing anything much we are just only providing the facilities here and uh, thank you so much and with him dr uh, balakrishna reddy who is a uh, alumnus of our uh, university and he study he has given a talk and uh, thank you uh, reddy garu being with us and uh, now and supporting us thank you so much and uh, without financial support this event would not have happened our alumnus uh, mr k vijay prakash garu and my good friend and who graduated msc biochemistry uh, the year 1991 and many of you know i think those of the, our faculty in uh, dr naresh and other people they know know him very well he started a company called sp acura uh, in hyderabad they do lot of oncology generics and his company grown up now the about 300 people are working with him and are doing a lot of wonder wonderful drugs in his company and uh, we have of the organizing committee and university so uh, thank you so much for giving this uh, now the financial support and to say you now like i i request i have some my personal not interest my pers- selfish interest because i am taking care of the ecwd as a chairperson i know since you know this is you know, connecting a meetings you now scientific meetings are different giving a social service is a different i asked him can you support us for my the pwd stu- student person with uh, disabilities he readily agreed is whatever support i propose he said he will uh, ready to um, you know support them like laptops motorcycle and with this now i give him a big applause you know for your support and we will soon will give you the you know the proposal uh, my it is my pleasure and thanks professor naresh babu always with me and you know he is uh, no um, he is also did the same duty with, like me thank you so much uh, naresh babu who is uh, now really supported my sincere thanks to uh, dr brahma bindu madhav reddy and uh, dr anil kumar who also supported who is taking who took care of the the food and also other snacks and you know other uh, the uh, support thanks to colleagues school of life science faculty and the scientists who came from other universities or institutions thank you so much being with us and um, the students post docs inspire faculty all of you i know without you this program would not have been successful thank you so much and um, and finally you know anusha miss anusha divya and his a team who anchored this event thank you so much uh, you know for helping us and thank you i thank sub, sorry, the supporting staff and other you know if you forget someone you know please pardon me and uh, thank you one and all being with us thank you so much